Chapter 37 Jaron Calavan Jaron drove up the steep hill, noting how the houses around him changed from crumbling ramblers from the 60s to newer, larger homes. The higher the elevation, the fancier the houses. His destination was the very top, where the steep hill flattened out into a 12-acre plateau, fully fenced to create the Calavan estate. Even from outside the property, the mansion itself rose into the sky casting its shadow over the surrounding landscape and dwarfing the surrounding homes. Jaron didn't approach the front gate. He parked on the opposite side of the road and got out. He walked down the road, casually. With a quick glance, he saw the familiar red light of a hidden camera at the corner of the house. The security system was up and running. That meant the cameras would pick him up if he crossed closer to the black iron fence. He felt a strange surge of hope. If the security system was on... Maybe his father was staying here. Maybe he could find him and convince him to go back on the contract. He didn't really have a plan, but if his dad was here, he wanted to try and do something. He couldn't give up like Gabe. The guy acted like some kind of hero, but brushed off possessed like they didn't even matter. Jaron was better than that. He had to try and get his dad back. And the first step was to get inside without setting off the security system. And he already knew how to do that. This was his home the house and yard, his very own playground. He followed the sidewalk around the far side of the estate, where the sidewalk ends and an abandoned walking trail disappears into tall foliage, an area outside of the estate that Xander Calavan prevented from being developed. Several yards down the trail, Jaron found the spot he was looking for. He looked both ways, checking for any sign of life through the fence. No security guards, no maintenance staff. The grass was yellowed from lack of water, Bushes hung limp, like overgrown hair on a chimpanzee. Broken glass and garbage were strewn about the ground. No one had bothered to clean up after the protests. It didn't look like anyone had been around the mansion for several weeks. The place looked forlorn. He felt a twinge of sadness that such a beautiful place had gone to hell, but he was looking for a demon, so maybe hell was the right place to be. Jaron lined himself up with a giant tree growing between the fence and the mansion. Next to Rachel, this tree had been his best friend growing up. Not only was it excellent for climbing, but it sat in exactly the right location to create a blind spot in the security feed. Jaron and Rachel had spent weeks analyzing and testing the security system one summer. They found this gap and kept it a secret, pretending that one day the blind spot would come in handy. He never expected that day to come. Keeping the tree lined up with the main window on the mansion, Jaron approached the fence. He gripped two of the square bars in front of him and wedged a foot in the gap between. His foot had grown since the last time he'd climbed this fence. It made the fit tighter, the climb easier. He alternated jamming his foot in between the bars and grabbing the fence a little higher. The 14-foot fence seemed smaller than he remembered. He made it to the top and stepped between the pointed rods. He pushed off, propelling himself into the air. He landed lightly as a cat, knees bent to absorb the shock. He stayed in that position, crouched low with his hands brushing the brittle grass. No alarm, no shouts. He thought he heard a noise and the hair rose on the back of his neck. He thought of the crazy old guy, Vox, and his crowbar assassination. He saw the blank emotional look of the guy with the triangle tattoo. Possessed. He hadn't made the connection before, but that wax look was what had made his dad look so wrong when he confronted him outside of XC Energy. Jaron didn't know a lot about Possessed. He probably should have asked more questions, but Gabe had sounded so final, so sure, as good as dead, worse than dead. He clenched his teeth. He didn't know what he would be facing, but it had to be better than giving up, than letting something run around with his dad's body. He told Gabe that he was delusional, but deep down, Jaron believed it, was glad to believe it. At least he had some sort of explanation about what had happened to Xander Calavan. At least his dad wasn't brushing him off like when he was little. He heard no more sounds except for the creaking of the branches above him. He stayed, crouched low, and moved toward the tree, smelling autumn as he brushed his hands along the crisp leaves on the ground. It was an old tree, probably the oldest tree in L.A. Most of its branches were thicker than Jaren's body, the trunk challenging the length of a small car. Jaren climbed easily his heart pumping with adrenaline. He must face his father, but he couldn't give him any warning. No time to call for wax figure backups. The branches higher up were only as thick as his upper thigh and had grown long, 
reaching out toward the mansion like fingers trying to grip the window sills. He shimmied out onto the limb, stretching over the grounds and reaching all the way to the roof of the mansion. Jaren's weight started to bend the branch lower as he scooted forward. The branch touched down on the roof, creating a solid bridge right above the balcony he needed. He swung down, grabbing the branch with both hands and letting the momentum of his weight carry him around and up in an arc. He let go and landed on the balcony. The window was unlocked. He'd expected to have to short the security alarm on the window, but it was already done. The screen already removed. The window slid open. The smell hit him, followed by a burst of hot, rancid air. He pulled his shirt up to cover his nose to keep from gagging. Mold and rotten water, broken sewer pipes, stale air like it might come out of a tomb. His heart fell as his feet touched down onto thick carpet. His father wasn't here. Even in his possessed form, the guy wouldn't have left the mansion sit like this, not even cleaning up the inside after the riot, leaving the broken pipes. The water must have been turned off, but the dry pea trap smell told Jaren no one had used the sinks or toilets. Damn, he'd hoped his father was here. He'd been dreaming of a reconciliation, a hero's journey, where he confronted his dad and found a way to get him to turn back. His dad was stronger than any contract. His soul was stronger than some wax figure demon. It must be. Despite feeling the emptiness of the house, Jaren started his search. When he moved down to the second floor, he heard noises. A shuffling sound. A drawer shutting. He froze on the last step, his foot hovering an inch from the floor. He had to fight an urge to run back up the stairs or hide in the corner. But he didn't come here to hide. Someone else was here. They hadn't bothered to turn on any lights. Could it be his dad? Or was it another member of the Triune? Would Jaren die in his own home? Would they leave a triangle as a message, the carpet soaked in his own blood, the hairs rose on the back of his neck? His fingers gripped the handrail, nails biting into the wood. Jaren backtracked to his own room and grabbed a baseball bat from his closet. He tried to be a baseball player when he was younger, but standing out in the field, waiting nine innings for someone to hit a ball his way, was too slow-paced. Still, a baseball bat worked in every 80s action film, so he might as well go out in his fan-era style. He slipped back along the dark hallway. When he got closer to his father's office, he heard the sounds again. He saw an inconsistent light flash under the closed door. He stepped forward, shifted his grip on the handle of the bat to one hand, and reached forward to turn the door handle. The door swung open. Jaren swung the bat and heard a cling of metal as the bat connected, with a sword, in the hands of Rachel Sampaio. What are you doing here? Jaren tried to pull the bat back, but the sword had embedded into the wood, and Rachel wasn't relinquishing the sword. What am I doing here? What are you doing here? Sneaking around your own house with a bat? Rachel took the bat and wedged it into the doorframe so she could pull the sword free. Where did you get a sword? It's been hanging in your dad's office since we were kids. It's not real, just a display, but when I heard that board in the hall creak, I got freaked out. You got freaked out? I thought you were possessed. Possessed? Never mind. It's a long story. Maybe it's story time. I came here to get some answers, but it looks like most of the stuff got taken in the riots. Jaren pulled Rachel down the hall, into the library, and around the back of the last row of books. He felt the small crevice behind the bookshelf, slipped his fingers into it, and slid the bookcase sideways a couple feet. We can talk in here. Who knows who might be listening to my dad's office. You used to hide in here all the time, Rachel said, ducking into the small opening. I can't believe your dad never found you. I don't think he ever looked. The room was only a few feet in diameter. The dim light filtered in through a small square skylight at the peak of the roof. The walls and slanting roof were covered in crayon drawings, like hieroglyphics in an ancient cave. These were Jaren's dreams, each image created from his own hand, expanding and transforming as he grew older. He'd drawn images of daring rescues, catching a bus falling off a bridge, punching an eight-legged creature attacking a group of children. He was the protagonist, the hero, a stick figure drawn in black, fighting the world, beating up his own fears. One of the drawings stood out from the others, larger and protected by a bubble of blank wall, as if the sacredness of the drawing prevented the others from encroaching in on its space. It was the drawing of a family, a tall stick figure in a gray suit and tie, a small figure drawn in black crayon with an identical suit. Beside the shorter boy, a third figure was etched on the wall. The details were missing, and the figure was scribbled out. 
Rachel reached out and touched it. A mom you never knew, she whispered. We could never take the place of someone who had never been there. She probably left after she found out what kind of man my father really was. You don't know what happened? And I'll never find out. Gabe said my dad was gone, as good as dead. Why? Jaron told her what Gabe had said about possessed, about angels and demons, about trying to protect the world from darkness. He sounds like your kind of guy. Rachel motioned to the other pictures on the wall. He's no hero. He won't even try to help my dad. And you came here to try? Jaron turned away from Rachel. He couldn't look at her because it felt like his failure was written all over his face. He'd failed to make his dad proud. He'd failed to get his dad to choose him over his business. And now he was going to fail to bring his dad back. Rachel stepped closer, her head brushing the ceiling. Jaron was hunched over, unable to stand up straight. She tilted her head back, looking up at him. You spent too much time here, Rachel said. All these drawings, all this talent wasted. You'd think with all this practice, you'd be on your way to becoming a professional artist. She walked her fingers along his waist to his back, wrapping her arms around him. He leaned into her. She had a way of making him feel whole, even while he was cracking into a million pieces. She held him together. He couldn't imagine losing her. He bent his neck, and Rachel went up on her toes. Their lips touched. A pause, the excitement building. Then she squeezed her arms, pulling him into her, pressing up so that his head hit the ceiling, pinning him as their mouths moved together. Opening, touching, tasting, he felt her smooth teeth, her warm breath, her fingers against his skin under his shirt. A kiss for the ages. A kiss that could take him away. A kiss that could make him forget. Rachel pulled back for a breath. But when she leaned toward him again, Jaron stopped her. I came to find my dad to see if I could help. But I don't want to drag you any deeper. I don't want to risk seeing you get hurt. You know it's too late for that. You think you're the only one your dad has hurt? You think by keeping me safe now, you can erase everything that your dad has done? Rachel's fingers flexed against Jaron's back. Why would you come here without me? Jaron asked. I would have helped you. Rachel shook her head. You cut me out. It was more important to keep me safe than to let me battle my own demons. He let my mom die. He ignored her when she got sick. He didn't lift a finger when his insurance company refused to cover the hospital costs. You forgave your dad too easily when he opened his arms to you. And you deserve that. You deserved a dad that cared. Rachel took a deep breath, but I never could. Jaron's mouth was dry. His throat felt swollen. He reached out for her, but she put up her hand. Rachel's mom had been the closest thing he'd had for a mother, but he hadn't known his father's role, hadn't realized Xander had refused to help. It's too late for my mom, but I want answers. I can't ignore the chance to find the truth. Too many things don't fit. The timing, the company, the press releases, everything feels purposeful and planned. But none of it is translating into money. When a business does shady things, you expect a money trail where someone somewhere is gaining while everyone else loses. Are you sure you want to be a part of this? Jaron asked. After what Box told us? About what could happen to you? Rachel leaned forward, the flashlight creating dark shadows around her eyes. If anyone tried to come for me right now, they're the ones who would need to worry. Jaron felt a thrill at Rachel's intensity, a lightness in his chest. Rachel was on his side, and he wouldn't watch her anywhere else. Okay, let's look at everything again. Are you sure there's no money trail? There's always money. Nothing that raises a red flag. Rachel straightened and began to pace. What about influence? Jaron asked. Anyone using this as a political advantage? Start a war? I can't find anything like that, Rachel said, tapping her chin with her finger. No big fallout, no fingers in the wrong pie. It looks like a simple company shutdown and rearrangements of resources. Other than the basement fire that destroyed most of the company's information, there was no other suspicious activity. But who knows what was being covered up by the fire? There would have been so much to go through, but now there's very little information. Jaron pulled his phone from his pocket. He hadn't looked at the pictures he'd taken in the basement with everything else going on, and he still had the manila envelope Fox had given him. Maybe Rachel could make more of the information than he could. 
This is all I could recover before the fire took everything, and I still have the manila envelope from Vox. You haven't looked at it yet? I took a picture of them, but they don't show a lot. Jaren showed her a screenshot of the two pieces of paper in the manila envelope. The first looked like a criminal file. There was a square on the left for a mugshot. It didn't contain a photo, only a generic silhouette of a person's head. The man's information was only partially filled in. Caden Bachman, Rachel read out loud. Age unknown. Address unknown. Phone number unknown. Wow, this is really helpful. He's managed to stay anonymous while being one of the largest business tycoons in the industry. He guards his privacy more carefully than he does his money. He has funded the startups of eight of the largest companies in the world, but all his business is done through his lawyers and CEOs. Box was trying to connect him to several criminal lawsuits, but there's no way to stick anything to him. Look at this. Rachel pointed to the background section. It says he's suspected of espionage, money laundering, missing persons, arsenal, and genocide. How do we not know more about this guy? Here's the next page. Jaron swiped on his phone. He enlarged the images, and both he and Rachel leaned closer. The three grainy pictures on the phone looked as if they'd been set crooked on a black-and-white copy machine. The first picture was the back of a man walking alone down a deserted street. The second picture captured a profile of the same man in an identical suit. He had on a hat and wore it low. His head was tilted toward the camera, so only the bottom half of his face was visible. The last picture was black, with a few blurred white streaks through the center. How is that even a picture? Rachel asked with disgust. How can this be all the information even an investigative reporter like Vox could have on such a bad guy? He's thriving on other people's money. His suit is not just off the rack at Gucci. That's a made-to-measure for Avanti. Rachel gave Jaren a flat look. Okay, maybe not that helpful, but I do spend a lot of time around expensive suits. Jaren flipped to the next picture. What's this? Rachel asked. It's a screenshot of the last information my dad looked up before he destroyed the servers. I took a picture of the computer before the fire destroyed everything. Rachel took the phone and squinted. It doesn't look very important. Just a list of random names. You should have held still when you took the shot. It's blurry. Excuse me, I was running for my life from a demon-possessed man with an axe. They aren't names I recognize from my research. She read them out loud. Foster Jenkins? Mike Jenkins? Could be anyone. Pat Grayson? Jake? He grabbed the phone from Rachel. I didn't recognize them, but I've heard these names before. Who are they? It's the names from the family. The foster family Trayden was looking for today. The names of the missing kids were on the screen in XC Energy's basement. You think it's connected? You think this guy might have something to do with Ellie? We need to tell Trayden. 